Hello to chapter 62 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. This chapter is titled The Dart. A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whale boat pushes off from the ship with the headsman or whale killer as temporary steersman and the harponeer or whale fastener pulling the foremost or the one known as the harponeer oar. Now it needs a strong, nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of twenty or thirty feet. But however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harponeer is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the uttermost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated, loud and intrepid exclamations. And what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass while all the other muscles are strained and half-started, what that is none know but those who have tried it. For one I cannot brawl very heartily and work very recklessly at one and the same time. In this straining, bawling state then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harponeer hears the exciting cry, Stand up and give it to him! He now has to drop and secure his oar turn round on his entire half-way, seize his harpoon from the crotch, and with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harponeers are madly cursed and disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harponeer that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath, out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when most want it? Again, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat header and harponeer likewise start to running fore and aft to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and everyone else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolishness and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from the first to last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery it has not by any means been so much the spread of the whale as the before-described exhaustion of the harponeer that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harponeers of this world must start to their feet from out of idleness and not from out of toil. So that was chapter 62. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 63 titled The Crotch.